This is John. Hey guys, this is John. Nope. No audio. <laughs> Great. Hey guys, this is John. We're gonna be making deer snack sticks tonight. This is just a quick audio test. We're gonna go back, finish a few things up and be ready right at 5.30 for once. Hey guys, this is John from Walton's and this is a process stream, which is just a live stream. We throw on the camera while we're making something. I've got chat up on a big board, so I'll be able to answer questions, comments, whatever as they come. Won't be able to type because my hands are obviously gonna be dirty, uh, but we wanted to do this one a little bit later in the evening so more people could hopefully get to watch it, uh, get a chance to ask questions, interact a little bit. Uh, we're doing this for a class we're having with uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, the Kansas chapter, and uh, Pass It On Outdoor Mentors, uh, both of those organizations that Walton's works really close with. Both are phenomenal organizations, uh, so we're going to do an in-person class this Saturday. I think there's still some tickets available. Go on to Pass It On Outdoor Mentors website, click on like events, um, and then scroll to this Saturday, click on it, and you can get your tickets there. I think there's only like 10 tickets left or so. Uh, we do have limited space, we're limiting it to 50. Uh, for anyone who's watching this and is coming, this is what you're gonna be eating or taking away with you. I will make sure that everybody leaves with some venison snack sticks. So there's a couple different ways to make venison snack sticks. Probably the most common 
is a 50-50 mix of venison and pork butts, untrimmed pork butts, which is great if that's what you can get. But untrimmed pork butts are right around 30% fat. So when we mix that with uh, deer, which is super lean, we're somewhere around 15% fat. That's really not enough for a snack stick. So you've got a couple options. You can either go heavier on the pork butt or you can do what we like to do, use straight deer and add just pork fat. We're adding about 25% pork fat. Um, I've got it over there, it's been frozen for a while. Cut it up uh, and we're gonna grind it. So, first thing we've done obviously is we've sanitized everything. Uh, with this sanitizer you spray things down, let it sit for about a minute and then you can wipe it up um, and everything is perfectly sanitized. With Wild Game, that is extremely important. We're dealing with some bacteria here that can replicate every uh, 20 minutes, so they double every 20 minutes, which means within, I want to say, 12 hours, it's over, can be over a million. Now, that's not going to happen here. We've paid very close attention. This is a nice, clean deer, so we're not going to have that. But not every deer that you get back to your processing room is going to be under optimal conditions, so it's just something to pay attention to. Another thing we really like to do is get this deer super cold. When I say super cold, I mean like just shy of frozen. I don't know if you can see that, but it's hard. Um, I like to throw it into our blast freezer, which I know a lot of you guys don't, most people wouldn't have. It's like one degree. Um, I lay it out on a mostly single level. I let it sit in there for about 30 minutes and then I take it out about 10 to 20 minutes before I'm ready to grind it. Give it a chance to defrost just a little bit so it's a little easier on the grinder. The reason we're doing that is cold meat is gonna grind way better than warm meat. I know that might sound a little off, um, but when meat gets warm, it gets squishy, and it'll fight back over the auger. It's nice and cold, it's going one way. Uh, we have white oiled our plates and knives. Even just the few seconds it's gonna take the deer to get down there and start lubricating this plate, you can build up a lot of heat from the friction of the knife going up against the plate. So we put some white oil on that and it helps reduce that. We're going through a 3 8 plate first, uh, which is the most common plate. It's also called a 10 millimeter. Um, it's a very common plate for people to have. Uh, it's usually the biggest plate that people have. So it's easier on the protein if we go through a big hole first. Now, you could try going right from uh, a, you know, a whole muscle cut down to a tiny one eighths plate, but it's really gonna overtax your meat. There's some ways around that, and there's some things in the works in the future, but for right now, the best way to do it, we think at least, is to go ahead and do your first grind through this three eighths plate, and then do your second grind through a one eighths plate. So first grind usually goes really quick. Um, I did wanna, temp one of these and hope you guys can, can see it. So we're down to, oh, it's gonna keep going. We're at 30. I imagine this meets somewhere in like the 29 to 28 range, but apparently it's stopping right at 30 degrees. So right at 30 degrees, perfectly fine to grind. We're gonna put just a reasonable amount down there. And I've set up my little foot pedal over here. So we're just going. And I don't have my stomper with me, of course. Generally, the only time we're going to want to use the stomper is when what's happening is happening right now. However, you would normally say that. It's getting caught above the canister or the, the chamber there. So we're just going to use it to push it down and get it caught in there. We don't want to do a bunch of just like shoving down there. That can cause some back pressure. As you can see, this meat. It doesn't need really to be forced down. Good, good. Yep, we'll see you, bud. So first grinds are really fast. As you can see, this is going right through it. That's because the auger 
can grab this meat and push it down to that plate and knife in, with no problems. It's not fighting itself, it's just going right down. Now, we do have one piece right here that's a little bit too big to fit down that, so we're just gonna cut it. And uh, nobody else is in the building, so hopefully everything goes okay. Uh, if things just cut out, I don't, oh, I don't know if we told anybody I was doing this. Well, they might set the alarm on me. Probably should have told the people who normally lock up not to lock up. There's always one more thing that you forget to think about. All right, processing meat after hours. However, there's no cold beer. There is cold beer. I just haven't gotten to it yet. I saw somebody from Fort Worth down there. Uh, I used to live just outside of Fort Worth. I, I love the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Lots of great bars. As you can see, the deer's got a really nice reddish brown color to it. Makes. Are you gonna be able to get out? Yeah, yeah. Can you find whoever? Just make sure they don't lock me in here. Call the light, Rob. I'm trying to find someone right now. All right, then just go. Are they in the store? Uh, I would imagine they would. Be. Yeah, okay. So it's got a really nice reddish brown color to it. It works really well as a snack stick, especially if we're just adding pork fat. When we add the pork butt to it, that light pink color of the pork kind of cuts it and makes it just a little bit less dramatic. Plus, with certain seasonings, I really do feel like pork can change the flavor of the deer stick in a negative way. So a 50-50 pork, not quite as good as a straight venison with just pork fat. The reason we like pork fat more than like beef fat or anything like that is pork fat's got a creaminess to it that beef fat doesn't have. Um, the only other fat that really matches it is duck. And duck is A, it's pretty yellow. Um, and B, that's a lot of ducks you'd have to kill to get enough fat to do a batch of snack steak, summer sausage, or anything like that. The two seasonings we're gonna be using are taco snack stick and Willie's. Uh, Willie's is our best selling snack stick seasoning and for good reason. We'll go on runs here where we'll make a bunch of like, well, habanero barbecue is excellent, but something like dill pickle, uh, some of the more out there seasonings. But we always come back to Willie's because if I'm making a large batch of something, I'm always in the mood for Willie's. Not maybe always in the mood for like a, either a dill pickle or a gigawatt with ghost pepper cheese. Um, we're also gonna be adding just uh, cheddar cheese to both of these. Normally, I would add encapsulated citric acid, but I'm not for a couple of reasons. One, it's already 5.30 here, and I don't wanna smoke this as well tonight. Um, and two, there are a decent amount of people who object to the tanginess that encapsulated citric acid adds to meat. And since we're giving this to people who are attending a class, I just wanted to make it as palatable to the highest number of people. Now, as you can see, we're through close to 30 pounds of deer in just a couple of minutes with that first grind. Um, second grind is really what takes a significant more amount of time. Now, we're gonna do a couple of things to try to limit that to try to make it go as fast as possible. And we'll talk about that when we get to them. Um, I only grind my pork fat once. Now I'm doing two batches here. I'm doing uh, Willie's and I'm doing taco. So I'm gonna grind all my fat and all my lean separate and then we'll get together in the mixing stage. That does add some complexity to the mixing. Uh, we'll be a little bit more careful with how we load the mixer. Normally I would do it during the grinding phase, the second grind, but to make sure that, because it's two different batches, not everything's going 
together. Um, I want to make sure that the correct, each one has the correct fat content. Easiest way to do that is just to keep it separate until that point. And like I said earlier, we're going for about 35%, uh, or no, sorry, 25% pork fat here. 35%, maybe a little too fatty. There is a, a point at which you can't keep fat in your snack stick. It'll render out during the cooking cycle no matter what you do, and that's usually just north of 30. Now I'm all the way done with all of that grinding. I'm gonna take a little bit of the meat, I'm gonna pass it back down the grinder. This is gonna make sure that everything that gets through here gets ground at least once. If we just let it grind and then stopped it there, uh, we would run into a small issue of just having some larger chunks in there. All right, chat, I want to see the cops come and get, oh, cause in case I get locked in. No, the Waltons know I'm here. Plus we know, we know all the Bel Air cops. So I wouldn't be, wouldn't be too afraid of that. Um, yeah, the recent uptick in swatting that I've seen is a little concerning, but I trust all you guys. All right, so I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna throw it into our freezer. We just have a little chest freezer in here. Um, I'm gonna clean these off quickly, lay them back out on a, or it's not gonna be a single layer, but as flat as I can so I have the most surface area. So the meat is exposed to as much cold air as possible. I want that to get as cold as it possibly can because that will let the auger grab it better and push it down to the plate and knife. If we did it like this, it would still be fine. It would just take a little bit longer. Um, for example, we're looking at, it was what, 30 degrees before we ground it. We're at 32, 31.5. So we're at 31, no, we're at 30.6. So grinding it really didn't increase the temperature that much, but it did break up that tactile, the little bit of toughness to it that helps that auger. So just real quick, I'm rinsing all this off. And then I've got these handy wipes over here. Um, it's the same material, or the same material, same substance, same mix, whatever you would normally say, that's in that spray. It's just in a wipe. So it makes it a little bit easier. Now this honestly might be overkill. Um, sanitizing this because A, it's going right back in contact with uncooked meat. It's going to be frozen and then this meat is then going to be cured and cooked. So probably overkill, but why not? And then while this is getting some, uh, a little bit of freeze on it, we're gonna grind our pork fat, and that should be interesting. We've got so, a small amount of pork fat that I had ground before and then vacuum packed and froze, so I'm real interested to see what's gonna happen with that. I don't think it's gonna give us too much trouble, um, but we are on the fat. We're going directly through a 1 8 plate. We're not gonna go through a 3 8 plate first. Chicken chat. Uh, you have the annual meeting for food processors. Awesome. Kevin, how's it going? I saw somebody earlier saying that they've already processed four deers this year and that they were excited to watch somebody else do the work. I've got some news for you. Um, I didn't do much of this work. Uh, Kurt Ratzliff from BHA uh, processed the deers, broke it down. I'm just grinding it. This is the easy part if you ask me. Um, I'm a little bit different with deer. Uh, I, I love all types of snack sticks, summer sausage, bratwurst, cured sausage, smoked sausage, all that. So I grind a lot more deer than most people would. Um, generally, I steal the back strap or take the back straps and the tenderloin and everything else goes through the grinder. That's just because, I don't know, sausage is a super convenient way to 
eat any protein. Um, what I've been doing a lot recently is I'm making a, a red sauce, like a red pasta sauce, adding sausage to it, and then uh, just eating just that. No pasta, just the sauce. In fact, I brought it for dinner for when I'm done here. Because after we're done doing this, I'm going to clean everything. So I won't be home probably till like 9 o'clock. And I usually go to bed around 8. So I'm going to be off my schedule for a few days. All right, so this is going into our chest freezer right over here. And we don't have uh, enough room in that freezer to stack those individually. So what I did was took a piece of uh, butcher paper, the wax line paper, so freezer paper, and just put it in between. Uh, so we're switching now to the smallest plate. This is a 1 8 plate. So smallest hole as possible, or not possible, but the smallest hole is 99% of people will have. We've got a really nice sharp knife here. Uh, because the holes are so much smaller, it is going to be obviously a little bit harder for it to grind. So first thing we're doing, oiling our plate and our knife. There are a couple of different types of knives. There's a propeller style. And then this style. This style I've always found to be superior to the propeller style. Um, propeller style will work, but it doesn't have a relieved edge. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see that or not, but this isn't perfectly flat. It's just the leading millimeter or two that's going to come in contact with the plate. Beyond that, it is ground down for relief, so it keeps a small amount of the knife in contact with the plate. That helps with wear, extends the life of your plate and your knife. Um, and as you can see, when I switched out plates, I also switched out knives. You do not want to use one knife with two plates. It's gonna shorten the, the life of both the plate and the knife. Does that because they won't wear at the same rate. All right. Pork fat. Also, I saw your Papa Sop comment about the dance party. Um, there's too many people here. So I was joking around on Meat Just Stick saying if, if nobody showed up, you could come and I would just have headphones on dancing around as, as I was making this. So, but nobody wants to see that. My dance moves are almost as bad as my singing voice. So as you can see, it's coming out perfectly fine. Looks just like white spaghetti. The only thing we want to be careful here is because this pork is fairly frozen, we don't want to overload it. We just want to be put a piece or so down at a time. It's going at a fine speed, so. Yeah, I know, Ben. But I'm up by four, so it's almost, it's really almost like I work a split shift. Like my, I'm in here by 6.30 most days, but that's like somebody who wakes up at seven showing up at 9.30, so. And, 100%, my dogs take up way more time than most people's kids. They're terrible. For anyone who's joined us before when I've talked about them, uh, Riggins has separation anxiety, chews holes in my doors. We finally found something we think works. We leave on YouTube videos of my voice. And we did that today and it finally worked. So as you can see, 
even though this is through a 1 8 plate, it's still grinding really fast. And that's because it can grab this piece and push it down to that auger with no problem. If we went back through and tried to grind this again, this pork fat, which is prone to smearing, um, we'd have a heck of a time. Nice. Didn't drop a single piece. That will make cleanup easier. <laughs> no, no, no. We've tried CBD. I was talking to my vet the other day about other options, and we went through the list of all the things we've tried, and even she said, she's like, my God, you really have tried everything. He's just crazy. We rescued him, and we think he was a fighting dog before, so he's just got massive anxiety. I tell him all the time, he's super lucky that we took him, because 99% of other people would have been like, nope, take this crazy dog back. Okay, you hear that? I don't know if you could hear the change in the motor there, but when we're doing really cold fat like this, that's why I said we didn't want to put too much of it down at once. It can bog it down a little. So if you hear anything like that, stop adding for a second, let it clear, and just slow down what you're adding. When we do the second, gr oh, I'm gonna have to take off my foot pedal. And you're all gonna get a good chance to laugh at me. When we do the second grind uh, with the deer, I actually get a little step stool so that I can see down into the, uh, the chamber a little bit better. And we'll talk about why. I swear I don't do it just so you can make fun of me. We had a guy show up in the store the other day while I was out there helping, and he goes, oh, you're short. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I come off as being tall on a uh, camera, but I'm like five, eight and a half. I want that half. It's all in there good. Why am I taking that off? There's no reason to take that off. All right, we'll go get the first bit. Now, you can see it really well up against this clear white pork fat. You can see some gray in there. That's nothing to be worried about, nothing to be worried about. Um, it's just the, uh, the white oil, though it doesn't really gum up, it does eventually kind of come out as like a gray grease, but it's fine. So while not my first choice, um, I did have some Bud Light in there. Uh, somebody was nice enough a couple of weeks ago to drop me off a, a six pack of their home brew, and that stuff was phenomenal. Um, I'm not normally an enormous wheat beer fan, but he had an apricot wheat that was just perfect. All right, so what was it in there for? Five minutes, how much did we do? I don't know, Not probably not a ton, um, but when we're making 
snack sticks, especially when we're doing it out of any type of wild game, every tiny little bit you can do to give yourself a little bit of an advantage is gonna help in the long term. Uh, we say it a lot, but like, most of like the things we call meat hacks, uh, stuff like that, isn't gonna revolutionize your process. But when you add them all up, it really can be the difference between making an average snack stick and making an exceptional one. So. All right, time to go get my step stool. Oh, I'm fine. Now I've touched something that's not sanitized, so that glove's gone. Um, I try, especially right now, to be better about glove management. Uh, and that's definitely something I learned how to get better at. Uh, I was terrible at it when we first started. I don't even know how many pairs of gloves I would go through, but it was, it was a lot. All right, so I'm gonna switch to our, or switch off of the foot pedal, because I'm gonna be up here looking down. So what I'm looking for, when I look down this, I can see the auger and I can see the chamber around it. Um, I only want to put enough meat down there. And then, I, so I had a small amount of meat down there. I wait until it clears that section and then I add another small amount. That might sound like it's going to take longer, but it's actually way faster. The only time you want to use this is the same thing in the, the first grind. There's this little chamber right in here, and meat has a tendency to sometimes kind of get caught up on this, like not to just drop down. So it just needs a little nudge down there. If you just try to jam it down there as much as you can, you're creating more pressure here and you'll get backflow. I don't even know if that's the right term, but it's when the meat tries to escape back over the auger. If you put just a small amount of, at a time, it'll just nicely and gently go down. So we'll put just a little bit of meat down there. Reach over. We're watching it. A little bit more. As you can see, it's pushing out that last little bit of fat first. Okay, so what do I mean by a little at a time? I'm gonna grab something like this. I'm gonna put it down there and I'm gonna watch it until it's completely cleared that chamber. Then I'm gonna grab another handful about the same size and just keep going. All right, now I don't need to be up here. Go check chat. Who said? Something is, I must not be level. It's usually not that loud. Oh, I know what that is. That's our fault. I took the cover off, so I wanted to see inside it and I probably didn't attach it right again. In the end, you could pretty much blame everything on me in some way, shape, or form. Um, Tim Williams says, so you're saying you think Willie's has heat? Cat pawing the meat is a great term. That is a great term to just doop, a little bit down. That is a great term, I like that. Cat pawing. So this will be the first batch of snack sticks I've made in a long time that won't have encapsulated citric acid. Um, 
Got a little bit ahead of myself there. Generally, I like it because normally when I'm doing this, I'm doing it during the day and I want to smoke at the same time. Plus, I am a fan of that tang. So encapsulated citric acid lowers the pH of your meat, uh, which also acts as a cure accelerator. Um, not exactly. It's not, it acts as a cure accelerator. Um, and it also helps with shelf life. So the lower, to a reasonable degree, the lower your pH is, the higher shelf life your product will have. The higher the pH is, the juicier your product will be. So it's a, it's a balance there. If you're looking for a juicy product, you're gonna have a shorter shelf life, which kind of makes sense, right? No, why would I pour beer down this throat? I mean, unless you mean my throat. That I can do. I can always tell when I'm getting too heavy because the, the back wraps of these have a tendency to uh, kind of hug my love handles. See, I put too much down there and I actually watched it get pushed back up because it was right at the edge here and everything started coming back up. So I'm gonna let it clear a little bit more and try to work on my patience. Yeah, um, there are definitely some seasonings that encapsulated citric acid works better with than others. Um, dill pickle, I think it works great with. Willie's, I think it works great with. Um, habanero barbecue is one I could probably do without. If I'm making habanero barbecue and I want to smoke it the same day, I'll often use smoked meat stabilizer. Uh, smoked meat stabilizer does have uh, some tang to it, but nowhere near as much as encapsulated citric acid. Or you could use something called sodium erythorbate. Sodium erythorbate's a super potent additive um, that does not impart a tang, but does accelerate the cure. And it has the added benefit of it burns the meat like a beautiful pinkish red. So if you're looking for a summer sausage with a really nice color on it, sodium erythorbate's a great thing to use. Yep, Willie's, I mean, it's the best selling snack stick seasoning for a reason. It's really, really well formulated. I, I had one guy once make, a, uh, make it with, he added jalapenos, mustard seed, I wanna say chives, and some extra black pepper. Um, so it, it also can work as a base. Like if you're looking for something a little different, it's a great place to kind of start also. It's helping a guy out on Meatistics um, the other day and he had tried to formulate his own seasoning. And I would say that is probably the worst thing you can do. Uh, it's up there at least with the worst things you can do because these seasonings have been formulated by really carefully by people who really know what they're doing. Uh, ingredients have more of a function than just taste, specifically salt, but there are other ones as well. Uh, salt in a cured sausage does more than just add taste it plays a functional role as well. And we can talk about that when we get to the, to the mixing phase. But you see what happens, I get impatient. I was doing great at just putting a little bit down at a time. I get, well, 
most of one beer in me and all of a sudden I'm using my stomper. But we can see we've got a really nice clean grind on this. Um, deer won't really smear. Uh, when you're doing pork or beef, you can look for something called smear. Uh, and that's when things don't turn out like nice white fat bits and nice pink meat parts. They just kind of turn pink. Um, and that is usually a good indication that you have a dull plate and knife or something else is wrong with your grinder or meat. Uh, with deer, I mean, there's very, very little fat in there to smear, but I mean, you can still kind of tell how nice the grind looks. And this just looks like delicious meat spaghetti, so. That is probably a good idea. Uh, so Neil is saying, the last time he made brats, he came up with the idea to use a 64 ounce ice scoop to take the meat from the tray or from the tub to the tray. And that is a pretty good idea. And we sell 64 ounce, I think so, maybe 32 ounce, but whatever. We sell decent sized ice scoops. So I might steal that on you. Um, and I don't know if anyone's noticed this yet, um, but I'm using, I'm planning on using sure gel for this. In fact, I already have it weighed out, uh, but we currently can't get sure gel. Uh, Excalibur's working on it. Uh, there's just problems in the supply chain. For those of you guys who are on Meatistics and saw my post about the rewards, um, knives are also a little bit tough to get. We can never predict what it is, uh, but something in the last two years has always been hard. We've just, it, I mean, that's how things are right now. Nope, it's gone. Yeah. You don't see Austin here, right? Team Blue all the way. That's actually not fair. Austin's doing other things. So I am happy to report that what Austin and I have been working on, and other people here, it's not just the both of us, um, and some other people here I've been working on is, is coming along nicely. Um, 2022 should be a, an interesting year, uh, an interesting in a good way. We should have some, some big improvements and a couple of new products that I think you guys are really going to like. I know I absolutely love them. One of them is that. I know you guys know we've been working on, uh, an electric sausage stuffer for a long time now. Uh, people who listen to the podcast heard Austin and I talk about everything we've gone through testing that. Um, and we're actually, we're not going, not back to the drawing board, but we've made another decent sized change to it um, in an effort to make it a little bit stronger. So. The good news is the finished product will be even better. The bad news is we're adding a couple of weeks to when we have it in stock. That makes it worse. Yeah. I turned on the air in here, but I'm already sweating. Uh, so John asks if I've ever used Sure Gel in a fresh sausage. No, 
Um, I've thought about it, but in the end, carrot fiber should work just as well um, at far less of a cost. Now, if you don't care about cost, there's no reason it won't work. Um, carrot fiber will do a little bit better at the moisture retention function. Uh, sure gel is more of a binder and carrot fiber is more aimed at uh, retaining moisture in a product, but it should still, should still work. There's no reason it wouldn't. Ooh. Paper towels. This will be interesting. This has been in freezer a good five, 10 minutes longer than the first stuff. So we'll see if this goes a little bit faster. Now, there's far less of it, so it definitely will overall go faster, but it'll be interesting to see if it seems to go quicker by the pound. Okay. nice, good, young, clean deer has a good smell to it, the meat. Because you kind of know, right? I mean, once you start processing it, you got a good feel for what your end products are going to taste like. In my mind, sausage can do a little bit more to make up for something that's not quite as fresh a meat, or fresh tasting at least a meat, um, than any way you're gonna smoke, grill, or cook it. Um, but your finished product is always gonna be dependent on what your meat was like. So yeah, some people use powder binder. Um, it's a non-fat, it's a non-fat dry m milk or something like that. Um, I think that's probably one of the oldest binders that people have used. Uh, in general, I would say at, use pork, or I'm sorry, use sure gel instead. It's actually created for that purpose. Um, but if you can't get it and you're in a pinch, um, I would probably still recommend going with soy protein blends instead. Uh, but again, if you can't get that, uh, lots of people do use the powder, not less and less people, but people still do use powdered milk. Um, there's also two other things we talked about. One a little bit, carrot fiber, better for fresh sausage, but plenty of people also use it in a cured product. And then there's something called super bind. Uh, Supervine's mixture of potato starch and carrot fiber. Uh, the potato starch is interesting because it forms a gel at about 130 degrees, which is same temperature. Meat really starts to excrete its water. So it, it does a really good job of keeping moisture inside meat or inside sausage. With a snack stick, with a summer sausage, we're trying to make a semi-dried product. Um, which is also part of the reason we recommend you cook all the way up to 160. You'll see some people say, you know, 155 for two minutes or something like that. But when you cook it all the way up to 160, in our opinion, A, you know you're safe. B, it's got a little bit better or more classic of a, a texture in our minds. Uh, one thing about that super bind, though, is if you're doing it with summer sausage, make sure you do not have voids. Stuff that casing really, really tight, because it will form a gel in any voids. And you'll just have this weird gel substance where, you know, a void would be in the sausage. Not, not a great look.
Oh, uh, I was wondering if you could... Okay. Ben, I follow you on Instagram, so I know you do enough processing where if you're drinking all the time when you're making stuff, that might be a problem. You might want to see somebody about that. It's funny, the older I get and people on the, uh, what is everyone drinking or whatever that post is called, I can't think of it right now, drink of choice. Uh, the more I'm enjoying whiskeys, scotch, bourbon. I did not like that stuff when I was in my 20s, but I'm a much, much bigger fan of it now. Probably a, a decent re portion of the reason for that though is I'd probably never had really good whiskey when I was in my 20s. I had plenty of really good tequila, but never spent any money on a good bottle of whiskey. So I would say the, the extra five whatever minutes uh, in the chest freezer for this second little batch, I wouldn't say this has changed anything at all. I'd say that's grinding at about the same speed. A perfectly acceptable speed for a second grind for a 1 8 plate, but I don't think it's any faster. Uh, Gary, the handle cracked on my 20 pound mixer. Send an email, keep forgetting to call the number they sent. Keep forgetting to call the number they sent back. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll get that replaced for you, um, so please do. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, we do the best we can, uh, but problems do happen in manufacturing. We will get that replaced for you, absolutely. So sent back, did, they, did you email or try and Chat in, how'd you, did you do like the comment through the website thing? Because if you do that, that is what they would tell you to do. Upside down stuffer. Or stomper. Okay. Yeah, uh, please do call in. Um, our customer service agents will absolutely get you taken care of, get that replaced for you. Obviously that doesn't help you with the, the batch you had. Um, so reach out to me on Meatistics. Might take me a little bit to, to get back to you, but we've got, got some jerky I'll send to you as a, apology, as a Maya culpa. Um, all right, so I'm gonna get this divided. I'm gonna start talking a little bit quieter since I don't have to compete with that anymore. Um, and then as I do the mixing, I'm also gonna do some cleaning, so. Yeah, so I can see that they would tell you to call in. Um, yeah, so just call in, they'll get you taken care of. If you have any problems, let me know, but you won't. All right, so we've got so we've got a total of thirty. Okay, we're good. Error? What do you mean error? Don't you error me? I think I threw too many different things at it at once. So 
So obviously the, uh, the advantage of the 50 pound mixer over the 20 pound mixer is one, um, you could hook it up to the grinder. It will do all the mixing for you, which is really nice. Um, and then it is also a little bit heavier duty. Um, I mean, that 20 pound mixer should work perfectly fine. That's not, you know, I'm not saying it shouldn't, um, but it is a little bit heavier duty. Um, one of the things, well, that's not possible. There you go. Uh, one of the things we're seeing with the, uh, with the stuffer is the differences in the protein we're using really does play a, a significant difference in how that machine performs. Um, if everybody was just gonna use it to make pork, I'd 100% say we're good to go. I'd have them in stock and, you know, they'd be on the shelves already. But uh, it does not perform quite as well uh, with beef or with deer. It's a denser meat and it just gives it a little bit more to fight against. So, um, yeah, so we have them uh, beefing up the motor, increasing the torque uh, so that it can do a little bit better with some, some wild game. Well, now I don't want to drink that because I just touched the mouth of it with dirty deer hands. <clears throat> Pork fat is always amazes me at how little this weighs. That handful right there weighed a pound. That always kind of just takes me back. Not takes, takes me a back. I figure that it would weigh more than that. Okay, good to go there. Probably I should, sh should switch out gloves here because all I'm doing is everything I'm touching, I'm making disgustingly greasy with the pork fat. But I care about the environment. I guess you guys don't, but I do. All right. Here is my mixer that I have pre-sanitized. And because we're not using, um, since we're not using any encapsulated citric acid, we really don't have to be too careful about how we do things. Uh, when we use encapsulated citric acid, we have to add, we have to add the pork fat during the last 60 seconds. Totally vertical? No, just passed. Get in there. Is there something blocking this? Is that not back far enough? We're gonna take this little side knob all the way out so that we're sure that's not what's stopping me. There we go. Um, so we can just basically add everything all at once. Now with deer snack sticks, you have kind of a, a decision to make. Let me get that in the cooler before I do anything else. Yes, it's still probably in the low 30s, but again, with wild game, we never wanna take any chances. So with deer, you kind of have a decision to make. Um, there are a couple different thoughts on what a 25 pound batch actually is. Does it include the seasoning? Does it include the water, additives, things like that? Some people say yes, some people say no. My take on it has always been there really isn't a right and wrong way. Um, but with deer, especially if you have any inkling 
that this might not be the, the best deer, I would highly recommend that you factor in at least the weight of the seasoning. So if you're using a two pound bag of seasoning, use 23 pounds of meat. Um, I don't think adding in the water is necessary to that, uh, but seasoning can definitely help. Okay, so we're gonna do the taco snack stick first. And I am taking these off. Getting myself another, another beer. Oh, these are twist offs. All right, so we got taco snack stick. This is 1.3475 pound. Um, we've got the sure cure already in there. Salt, number one ingredient, which is what we would expect on a cured sausage like a snack stick is. Uh, then we've got dextrose spices, including chili pepper, onion and garlic powder, tomato powder, and some sodium erythorbate in there. The sodium erythorbate in there is not enough to accelerate the cure. That's a good tip, or a good thing to mention. It's not really a tip. If in the ingredient section, if it's not a ham or a bacon cure and you see something like encapsulated citric acid or citric acid or sodium erythorbate, any of those additives that have an additional function, don't like take that to mean that it has a cure accelerator or uh, a binder or a pH dropper in it. That's added for a coloring factor or some other flavor factor. So just something to think about. Um, I've also, earlier today, I poured my water out, measured my water out. Um, with deer, I generally tend to go a little bit heavier on the water. Um, when adding sure gel, which I am, I've got sure gel and my sure cure in a bowl right here. I say you can add up to one and a half liters of water to a 25 pound batch. Uh, I'm gonna add all the seasoning, about half of this water. Then I'm gonna add the cure and the sure gel binder. Then I'm gonna add more water as we go, kind of play it by eye. But the first thing we're gonna do is get all of that seasoning in there. And the reason we're adding the seasoning right off the rip, first thing we wanna do is because we want that salt to start interacting with the meat. Yeah, it's because I took that side panel off. Um, we want that salt to start interacting with the meat. <coughs> Probably should have put the top on. Uh, so the salt is going to do more than just flavoring. It actually helps solubilize. It actually helps solubilize the protein uh, in the muscle and it lets protein extraction happen more rapidly. I don't know what you guys saw there, uh, but the bowl of pre-measured out sure gel and sure cure that I had just fell off. So yes, people saw it, okay. Yes, awesome. Cause that'll be, that'll be easy to clean up. I don't know if you've touched sure gel before, but it's certainly not like very thin and get everywhere, not at all. Oh, most of it went right back in the bowl. I can actually just add more cure to that and I'll be good. I once broke two uh, ceramic bowls in the same day by doing exactly that thing. I set them up here, vibrated, fell off, didn't learn my lesson, put it back up. Long story short, I don't learn lessons.
plastic hamburger paddle. One of the best mixing uh, accessories you can have. They cost like $2 or $3, something like that. Who knows, now probably more, $4. But super easy way to get your meat off the side and back into the mixing section. All right, so I'm watching this and it looks pretty stiff. Um, like I definitely I'm getting some protein extraction already, but I can feel it as I'm touching the meat with the paddle. It's got a lot of resistance to it. So I am gonna add some more of that water for sure. And I don't know if that's picking up through here, but you could hear a thunk, 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 thunk. So that water went down to the bottom of this and the meat is getting pushed through it and it's starting to pick it up. And you can already see a difference in the consistency of the meat. It's good. All right. Stay. With my recent luck of balancing things, I was a little bit worried about that. Ooh. Now with cheese, generally, you really can add it right from the beginning. Um, I don't always like to, but it's more of just a, I don't know, a throwback to how I always did things. Uh, when we first started working with cheese, I would always recommend people freeze it and then add it with their encapsulated citric acid during the last 60 seconds because I was afraid it would smear. Um, Dylan, who is our VP of sales and our kind of just all around meat genius, expert, whatever, uh, assures me that it's absolutely not necessary. So. Now, one of the questions we get asked occasionally is, can you over mix your meat? Yes, you can, but it's really, really hard and really unlikely that you will. Um, it's possible, but like, like I said, very, very unlikely. All right, we're gonna check this for protein extraction and that is nice and sticky. That has got pretty much perfect protein extraction. We might give it just another, we really don't need to give it any more time. That's good. I just put on these gloves. I do not want to take them back off. Oh, the difficult decisions that are, that is being me. Uh, this is a, a great tip if you have one of these tilt stuffers while it's still hooked up. Now you have to hold it down because it's gonna try and go on you. And for the 10th time doing this, I've done it backwards. You want to be on the other side with your uh, meat lug. You could even kind of see as I went, it pushed down on the meat lug, not tried to fight me back. So the better protein extraction you have, 
uh, the dirtier job this will be. Get Mike Rowe in here. For the next one, we'll flip everything around so you guys can see it work. Still probably would be better off doing that now, but I've already begun and I'm stubborn. is some really, really good protein extraction. Everything is super sticky. Um, both a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing. It just makes this step a little bit more difficult. And it's going to make cleanup significantly more difficult because everything is going to have to get cleaned inside and out. I was keeping an eye out to see if Austin was going to be in the chat at all tonight because I do have a small little joke for him. But So if anyone sees him, call it out. Let me know. But even if he doesn't show up, we'll still, we'll still do the joke so I can show him a timestamp and tell him things went just a little off the rails. All right. All right, now unfortunately in this room, I don't have a cooler that's big enough to handle a meat lug. Uh, so I'm gonna run this to our walk-in cooler, it's just down the hall. I'll be back in a second or two. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> you guys can probably still hear me, huh? <laughs> I didn't take that into account. Thank God I didn't say anything stupid. <laughs> uh, yeah, as I was walking away, I didn't realize that you didn't even think about the fact that you guys would still be able to hear what I was saying. Um, luckily, I didn't say anything stupid. At least I don't think. You never really know with me, do you, though? All right. Somebody in the chat, give me a timestamp. How far into this are we? John, was the biggest batch you would hand mix for protein extraction? I hate hand mixing. Um, the smallest this will handle is 12 and a half pounds. So I'd probably do anything under 12 and a half pounds by hand mixing just because I can't do it in this. Uh, I saw the Sure Gel added, but not the Cure. Sure Gel is mixed in with the Cure. Um, we're gonna have to pull the as much of the cure out of this as we can and re-add it because I spilled that one. Uh, yes, it's kind of what I was thinking, John. Um, I would scrape the mixer with the paddle after and fry little patties. That's always a good way to do them. Uh, we were waiting for a comment. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, so when you over mix your meat, you can run into something that has, 
you'll get almost like a, a fat out about one hour and four minutes. Okay, 40 minutes, okay. So let me tell you guys what's really going on here. Walton's is an enormous scam, the whole thing. Sorry, nobody else was here and I thought it would be funny to do a John conspiracy with a tinfoil hat on thing. Um, so I will show that to Austin tomorrow and hopefully he'll get a good laugh out of it. Uh, so back to the over mixing thing, you can get something that's similar to fat out is that you just overwork the meat to the point where the, the fat smears uh, and has a tendency to cook out. You also have some texture problems. You can end up with something that's a little like dry and crumbly. Uh, it's a little bit different than the dry and crumbly you would get from a normal fat out though, so. All right, on to the second batch. And I just plan on uh, leaving this on as long as I'm Stuffing, I mean, we've obviously, we've got this to mix. Sorry, as long as I'm processing. We've got this to mix and then I've got to stuff. Uh, so I'm at 6.30 now. I highly doubt I'll be done before 7.15, 7.30. So feel free to hang with us the whole time. We can just chat, keep asking questions, whatever you want. Okay. This time though, I will turn the mixer around, the whole setup. An easy way to remember that will be the little Walton's uh, emblem goes on the side that you want the thing to be on. Okay, get some pork fat in there. Good, good. Oh, I forgot to see how that little bit I'd already, of fat that I had already ground, how that did going back through, but I didn't notice any of the fat having any of the problems. So if you grind pork fat and you don't use it all, you can vacuum pack it and freeze it. And then when you cut it back up, uh, it'll still grind fine. It's a good thing to know, I guess. There was somebody earlier on this who said that it was their, they were doing their first batch of snack sticks ever, or first batch of deer snack sticks ever uh, this Friday. If they're still here, do you have any specific questions on that? Uh, I bought two cases of pork fat. Um, we know a guy. Uh, so we got two cases of pork fat for like 50 bucks. Um, but I think the last time I checked, it was around 250 a pound. I'm assuming it's gone up from that if it's even available. Um, I know for a while there, I just, I gave up on trying to get it because it was just impossible to find called butchers, processors, had a few of them say, oh yeah, we can get you it, but then never heard back from them. Um, but I imagine it's probably somewhere still in the 250. Uh, I'm guessing it would be 830 or 900. Eight, well, when I'm done uh, cleaning, I assume it'll be nine o'clock, um, but I'm definitely gonna be stuffed in an hour, right? Yeah. I also have a tendency to overestimate my ability to get things done, so we'll see. All right, so we're mixing in the seasoning and we're gonna re-measure the cure. Um,
I know most of you, if you're watching this, you probably already know this, uh, but one of the best things, uh, and this is the same amount of water that was in there. I just only had one that was big enough to control that. Uh, one of the best things you can get for sausage making is a scale like this, a Scali precision scale. This will measure in the fractions of the grams, so it's super convenient when we're measuring out additives. Additives, where's my cure? We'll get another one. Nothing happened there. I'm just measuring out one ounce. Uh, this is a four ounce package. Okay, and then I'm gonna try and take my sure gel and remove all of that cure. If I get a little bit of the sure gel, I don't really care because the sure gel at 0.3 of a pound per 25 pound batch and with how, I don't know, a good word for this, with how voluminous it is, um, a tiny little bit of that's not gonna matter. All right, so now we're gonna add our here and our sure gel. Put that back on there. Do not put that back on top of this. <laughs> Where'd you go? There you are. Ta da! Magic trick. I'm really knocking it out of the park tonight, huh? Started looking around like, where's my paddle? As soon as I thought that, I was like, oh no, that's in the mixer. So I actually, the reason we wanted to do this one, um, it's a couple reasons. One, doing them during the day is great and all, but I just feel like not that many people can watch and interact. And two, I mean, I haven't gotten as much of a chance to interact outside of the podcast and the occasional live stream um, as I would normally like to. Uh, but I also didn't want to keep anyone else here, so we figured... And well, what's the worst that could happen, really? The stream shuts down, is not, you know, this had to get made one way or another. It wasn't, wasn't that big a deal, so. But yeah, second hand always does help. Um, I rarely have one, which is fine. Most of the things we have now allow that to be pretty easy. Um, especially when we get into that electric stuffer makes a huge difference. By yourself, I would say stuffing is the hardest, well, cleanup's the hardest thing for sure to do by yourself. Um, but of the actual processing things, stuffing is the hardest thing to do by yourself. And that stuffer makes it a lot easier. Um, and for people who've been Walton's customers or known of us for a long time, you'll know that we had uh, a previous model of sausage stuffer. This is nothing like that. It's like a Cadillac to a Yugo or something. I don't, I don't know bad car. You can't even say like Hyundai anymore because Hyundai makes great cars, so. Uh, so the small scale is this, it's called the Escali precision scale. 
um, it measures in the fractions of grams. So up to 500 grams, it measures by the tenth of a gram. And then over 500 grams, it'll say like 0.5 grams, but not like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Uh, yes, David, it'll just live on YouTube. So on our YouTube channel, you could watch this again. Were you a glutton for punishment or something like that? But, um, I mean, this basically combines my two favorite things about this job, making sausage and interacting with you guys. So, I mean, once we get past some stuff, uh, get some things fixed, we'll have time to, to kind of re-engage on the, might not be weekly live streams like we tried for a while with Meatgistics, um, but like way more often of these process streams. Cause like I said, I love doing them. They're a ton of fun for me. So. They're even more fun when I have somebody else who I can just finish and walk away and let them do the cleaning. Don't have that tonight, but what can you do? Can't have everything we want, right? Ooh, that's gonna be fun to clean. All right, so this time I'm gonna try and turn all of this so you can at least somewhat see what I'm talking about when I say tilt it. I want to keep these in line as best as possible. So we'll do it like that. I'm going to, no matter how I do this, I'm going to block the camera. So we'll just try and figure it out as best I can. Oh, nope, wrong one. Stupid idiot. Okay, got it back in. Um, I meant to pull this, which is the locking pin. Instead, I pulled the axle pin. So we're gonna pull the locking pin, push it down. We've got this up against there. Gonna hold this down, otherwise it's gonna come back up, turn it on. And it starts, does like 70, 80% of it for you. Won't do all of it for you, but it does a huge portion of it for you. And then from here, we really just have to clean up. All right, 70 to 80% was a lie. I was being overly enthusiastic, 50% of it for you. Still, better than nothing, and certainly better than the first time. Because we are almost done. Um, and it's, this is the same thing as you'll get, or how much you want to clean this up is the same thing I say when people ask like, you know, how much of the meat should I get off a of pork butt? It's really, it's just up to you. How much time do you want to spend? How much time do you have? What's left in there is way less than a half a pound. Um, I could spend another four or five minutes and I might get, you know, a half a snack sticks worth of meat. And it's probably just not worth it to me. Um, so just that you can see what I consider to be a, a cleared grinder. Let me get this out of the way. <clears throat> or sorry, cleared uh, mixer. Get this out of the way and then I'll... So something like that. Still a little bit of meat on there probably on some of the paddles, um, but yeah, I'm probably not going much cleaner than that. The downside to this is, especially when we're doing things like this, this meat is going to set up like crazy. When you can go right from processing, like mix, clean, stuff, clean, it's not that hard to clean them, but that has its protein extracted, so it's getting nice and sticky. It's gonna start drying, which means in 20, 30 minutes, that is gonna need like some serious elbow grease to get off, but whatever. Mm. All right, let's clear this. 
And I didn't break this earlier. I just didn't want to use something after it hit the floor, obviously. All right, got my 11 pound sausage stuffer here. I'm gonna do everything into 19 millimeter smoke collagen. Actually, can someone tell me, can you see all this? I assume this is still in frame, but I actually don't know. Uh, I'm not sure, living free, it will to some, it won't to others. Um, there's two things you have to account for. Ugh. One is this is a six spline gear and the other one is the diameter of this housing. Uh, for whatever reason, they're made slightly differently um, and that housing can cause a problem. Do, 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 do. I thought I had a tape measure. I do have a tape measure. The diameter of this housing is two and a bit, not, not quite two and a quarter. Um, yeah, it's got the spline right in the middle, so I can't get a perfect read on it. Uh, but I would say two, yeah, probably two and a quarter. So you'd have to know six spline and two and a quarter housing, if that would work with it. In frame, cool, thank you. Uh, you ever tried hot water in the mixer and let it run? No, I haven't tried that. Um, I might, that's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, it's, nothing's gonna leak out of it. Yeah, I might try that. Um, another thing I've been interested to try, my wife ruined my experiment at home. It's my fault, I didn't tell her what I was doing. Um, but somebody on Meet Sticks was talking about taking old uh, dryer sheets and putting it in a pan that had like seriously stuck on grime, dirty things. Um, so I had a pan that I had cooked meat in and I took a dryer sheet and put it in there. She, re she saw it and took it out, but uh, I've been thinking about ways to, to try to test that here. So. Ooh. Oh, that's sad. All right. Let's load up. So when we're loading a sausage stuffer, um, I'm sure everyone who's still with us here has heard me talk about this before. This is my favorite size. Um, diameter of it is fairly small. It's the exact same diameter as the seven pound dual speed, but obviously it's got the extra four or five pounds, whatever uh, capacity, obviously four by numbers. You maybe be able to put a little bit more in here. Um, the best way to load it is an alternate angled stack. So the first one we're gonna do, we're gonna put the meat so that we can basically see the bottom of the metal up here. And we're gonna put it about three or four inches up back here. I'm gonna pack that down. Then we're gonna go the opposite way. I'm gonna pack that down. That seems to be, that sounded weird. Uh, that seems to be the best way to prevent air pockets. So I'm punching it down and I've got a good angle on it. So then I'm coming back and you can hear the air coming out of there. So I've got them nice and packed down in there. You can hear it as I punch the meat, you hear air getting pushed right back past it. Okay. 
And this meat is sticky. So thick, sticky meat. What does that mean? It means we're gonna have to, we're gonna earn our pay today stuffing, stuffing this. This crank's gonna fight us. Um, I've already lubricated the piston gasket. Lubricating the piston gasket helps a couple of ways. Um, it reduces the likelihood, it does not eliminate the possibility, but it reduces the likelihood of our gasket allowing meat to come up and around. Uh, it helps it stay tight up against the outside, inside, yeah, inside of the canister. Um, and it also extends the life of that gasket. Anyone who's buying a sausage stuffer, I always tell them the things that they should buy along with it, other than casings, are white oil. You can get these little bottles of white oil. They're inexpensive. You have to use a very small amount each time, so it'll last a long time, and extra piston gaskets, because once that gasket goes, your stuffer's not gonna do anything for you. Uh, collagen casings, in general, do have a correct and an incorrect way to go on the stuffing tube. Uh, this is the 12 millimeter stuffing tube. The 19 millimeter will fit over the 12 millimeter stuffing tube. It will also sometimes fit over the 13 millimeter stuffing tube, um, but it's not designed to do that. So the way you wanna load it, you wanna envision these as like a stack of kitchen bowls. And you wanna put it so the kitchen bowls are coming off. So like round side, faces up against the stuffer, and they will slide right on. Uh, you, obviously you can't feel this, um, but recently I've really noticed that a fresh casing that's still good will have an almost oily feel to it. If it's brittle, if it feels like paper too much, um, casing's no good. So, uh, stuffer's got two gears, top gear, bottom gear. Top gear is for getting the, the piston down to where the meat is and taking it back up only. It will not stuff. It's a great way to break your stuffer if you do that. So we're gonna move the handle down to the lower stuffer, lower gear, sorry, and begin. Uh, I've got, I've got uh, suction cup feet on these. We now sell these suction cup feet uh, for a while. We had a promo where if you bought a stuffer, these came with it. I think that has ended, uh, but they are really convenient. Uh, the only downside to them that I've found is that when you want to move your stuffer, it can be a little bit hard to do. But if you don't do that, you need somebody to either hold down the base or you have to be right on the edge and use a wood clamp. Now with a thicker, stickier meat, like this, uh, there's a possibility you still will need to clamp it down because this is gonna fight us. So. Now, when I'm stuffing this, I'm stuffing it, I'm trying to get it, got an air pocket in there, didn't I? Um, I'm trying to get it so that the meat, sorry, the casing is full and smooth. I don't want to be able to see this wrinkled pattern around it too clearly, um, but I also don't want it to be completely smooth. Without you guys actually stuffing it and seeing it, I can't really explain it better than that. Um, if you understuff a casing, you're gonna end up with an over-wrinkled sausage that doesn't have a good snap to it. If you overstuff your sausage, you run the risk of it breaking. Uh, you can get it to explode during the smoking process. And this actually is not fighting us as much as we th or as I thought it was, or was going to. It's actually stuffing pretty well. Oh, what do I hear? Yeah, it's not all of it. But at the beginning of this, we had a little bit sneak past our gasket there. Um, it's probably not that big a deal, but I'm still, once I'm done with this run, I'm gonna look at replacing that gasket with another one.
Then I've got ready over here. I've got some trays so I can lay this on. Um, found out the hard way that that can at least has the potential to stain uh, stone. I was able to get it out, but took quite a bit of elbow grease um, and really bad hour or so for John's anxiety. We just put this in and like maybe a month later, I come back from doing something else and I'd let them lay on this and all of a sudden I go to move them and there's lines right down it that just looked like reddish pinkish lines. Um, but yeah, I was able to get them out. Uh, when we smoke these, um, which I'll just put them in as soon as I get in tomorrow, um, we're going to lay them over smoke sticks in as long as runs as we can get. And then this casing is strong enough to deal with, if we hang it like this, we take our probe thermometer, it's got a, a string on it, cord on it. We'll also hang that cord over the smokestick and then we'll just push the probe thermometer down into that. Casing should be fine as long as we have not massively overstuffed or actually really, as long as we just haven't overstuffed it. Uh, casing should be able to take that hole being pressed or pricked into it um, and maintain the rest of its structural integrity. Uh, I'm behind, but I can't see. You didn't have the hopper snapped on that handle on the grinder top. Oh, are you saying that's why it was um, making that noise? Uh, what I believe it to be is that I took that uh, panel off I was checking something that I really had no reason to check. Um, and I don't think I put it back on quite right. When I squeezed it on the sides, all that noise basically stopped. So I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Might not have been, you might be right. Lord knows I'm not right about everything. All right, so we've got, uh, like I said, we've got some spillover. Uh, so as I come back, I'm gonna raise it. And once we get to a certain point, it's going to start fighting me. So I'm just going to grab it, bring it up. And that's not enough for me to bother taking the time to go replace that gasket. So we're just going to go again. One of the funny things is anytime, no matter what I try to how well I try to wash my arms after doing this. Anytime I'm stuffing sausage, my one dog will just smell my arms like they are the most amazing things in existence. It's without fail. No matter how much soap I use, anything, he knows. He's like, oh no, you had delicious pork or delicious something on you. Couple of, oh God, about a year ago now at this point, I gave my dogs venison for the first time. And man, I don't think I've ever given them anything and seen them light up like that. They went absolutely bananas. I think I'm gonna regret not changing that out. But again, stubborn. All right, so we're 7.07. I'm a little over halfway done with the first batch. Yeah, because it 
This one's gonna be a little bit harder. It's really not, it's doing the exact same thing. There's some of it popping up around it right away, but then it stops. It's interesting. But after this canister, I'm gonna go switch out the uh, the piston gasket just oh now that is a rookie mistake paying too much attention to the problems I'm having up there overstuffed and it split the casing it's really annoying but not a problem when we load it the next time We'll just put that back in there. Uh, since the casing split, all we have to do is basically just push that meat right back into the rest of the bin. Another thing, these handles, um, when it's pretty hard like that, you do want to watch out. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not losing this little gap or overage here with the screw. If it does happen, just stop, tighten it down again and keep going. Yeah, that's Worse this time. Definitely should have switched that out. Yeah, it's a good lesson, which I won't learn. Bottom out first or run out of casing? I'm gonna run out of casing first. Okay, so I'm not all the way at the bottom of that, but I'm still gonna bring it back up. Um, I'm hoping I have another, yes, I do. I actually have two more in here. So I practice what I preach. Always have extra ones of those. Sure gel and all, smoked sausage, I would totally agree with that. Uh, with most seasoning mixes, no, with the fresh seasoning, I wouldn't go with sure gel just because of, I mean, carrot fiber is less expensive and it does a more specific job at moisture retention as opposed to binding. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, if I've missed anything, I can't scroll back up. So just somebody let me know if there's anything that needs to be addressed, answer, answered, or anything like that. So um, I don't know. Maybe some of you guys haven't ever switched out a piston gasket before. I can show you there is, surprisingly, a correct way to orientate it. 711, darn it. I'm not gonna hit that 730. Come on. Again, it was really not as much as I initially thought it was, but like I said, I may be slow to learn, but I do eventually learn. So we're gonna replace that. Uh, 
Um, these gaskets, they tend to once they've done this, once they start allowing something past it, it's not always the case, but in general, um, the gasket is gonna continue to fail in that same manner. Uh, so you are probably best off just getting rid of it. You don't have to, um, I'm going to because I have you know, thousands of these gaskets back in our stock. Uh, for somebody at home, I would probably recommend you hang on to it. Uh, having a little bit shoot over the gasket is nowhere near as bad as having no gasket at all. So keep it as a backup. Yeah, that's a pretty loose gasket. Came off a little bit too easily. Um, show you with a clean one. So what I'm doing over here is I'm getting as much of the meat and cheese that is on the inside of where this gasket goes off as possible. Reason for that is we're gonna give the gasket a cleaner pocket to begin with. Um, if you put it on and it's already got some stuff behind it, you have a higher likelihood of that happening again. Um, if we were doing 100 pounds, honestly, I would, prop, I would probably stop and fully clean this. In fact, I'm gonna do a little bit better of a job than I was planning on. I was trying to think of a good comparison of like, as much as I like sausage making, as much as I dislike cleaning from sausage making. I don't have a good comparison for that. Um, the only thing I could come up with is as much as I loved playing football games in high school, as much as I hated practicing. That was the best I could come up with. I'm open to, to better ideas than that though. Ugh. Um, so I don't know, Adam, if you're asking me, uh, generally, yeah, I definitely do add encapsulate citric acid. Uh, this batch is not going to be smoked tonight. Plus it's going to some people that I don't know well, um, just some people who will be coming to a class. So not everybody likes that tang. Um, part of the reason we might've had a little bit of problem there is that gasket was, or that screw was tightened down way too much. Um, not sure that that was the, the cause, but I, it certainly didn't help. Uh, this air relief valve helps release pressure. And with it not being able to move at all, um, probably contributed to that. First, we got to put this back on. So this does have an upside and a downside. The downside is the, you want the gap in it to face down. So we're gonna put this on and we want the downside that is gonna touch the meat to have a gap between that and the start of uh, the gasket. They swear they didn't make any changes which means that I just did it wrong for like a year um, before finally someone told me like, nope, it goes the other way. And I have had a, a decent amount less blowouts. Um, and by blowout, I mean what we just dealt with there uh, since then. It seems to make more sense the other way to me though, which just goes to show why I'm not an engineer. 
tighten that back on, bring it back up. I stepped in a little piece of fat that I must have spilled on the floor. So my one foot keeps wanting to slip. All right, bring it back around this way. So we've got probably this one and less than another full one of this. And then we've got that other 25 pound batch. So we're not gonna hit 730, but I could still maybe get 745. Oh, just missed getting it all in this one. Lip always faces pressure. Hydraulic seals are the same way. Lip always faces pressure. God, that sounds so backwards to me. I mean, I trust you. Um, I definitely trust anyone but me when it comes to things like that, but it sounds backwards. There we go. Yeah, so it is stuffing a little bit, not much, but a little bit harder. So that pressure that was being relieved by it going up and around the gasket played some part into it being easier to stuff than I expected. Um, I'm gonna pull it back up here in just a second, fill it up with the rest of that so that I don't have to bring the gasket or the, the piston all the way from the bottom, back to the top, just to stuff a little bit. Oh, this is a, how well did I guess? I don't feel like I guessed well. I will be oddly embarrassed if I can't get the rest of this in there. Oh yeah, we're good. And just to show you that I'm not cheating, nothing left in there. Uh, so as far as, for anyone who hasn't done this, um, the amount of pressure you want to hold your stuffing, or your casing on your stuffing tube with, has a bunch of different, depends on a bunch of different things. Density of the meat, uh, how much water you added, and it's generally just a feel. You have to get a good feel for it. Uh, it really doesn't take much pressure. You don't want to hold it too tight. It is fairly easy to hold it on too tight and make it uh, blow like I did a couple, I don't know, 20 minutes ago or whatever. Uh, it's a fairly light touch. Once you get it, once you figure out what that pressure is, it is very much like riding a bicycle. Um, you'll be able to do it forever. Somebody asking which one, yeah, I'm using the 11 pound 
dual speed stuffer. Um, the only one that comes in a single speed is the seven pound. Um, and I mean, everybody's got a budget. And if it, the seven pound is what fits, then, or fits your budget, then go with that. But I would really would recommend that instead of going with the seven pound single speed, uh, you wait whatever it takes to save up the time or save up the money um, and buy at least the seven pound dual speed. The gearing is so much smoother. You're gonna save yourself a lot of time and a lot of frustration. Um, yeah, cause that, those vertical screw systems, it, it's a, it can be done well and it was at one point done well. Uh, like the really old enterprise stuffers are vertical screw systems, but it's, it's also those, you know, those were made when things were made out of cast iron and lasted longer than your kids were gonna be alive. So dual gear system, far, far better design. Seven twenty-three. All right. Well, there is not a chance that I can get the other one done in seven minutes. But if we don't have another uh, whatever this thing is called issue, uh, we will beat seven forty-five. So I'm gonna go throw these in the cooler, grab the other ones, and I'll be right back. So I'm sure you guys probably heard me making those old man noises as I was picking things up. It's really started at weird times. Just uh, even if I pick up anything that's not heavy, it's uh, ooh. Yeah, this, this batch is denser for sure. Oop, picked up a little bit of pork fat there. Eh, we're gonna have to reload multiple times anyways. All right, we should get this done fast enough where that's not, a concern how long that'll be out. This, by the way, is grape drink mix, like Crystal Light, but imitation with Sprite Zero, and it's the best drink ever made. It does leave me with a purple mustache sometimes though. Yeah, if anyone's watching this and you're not a member of Meatistics, you really should be. We have a, a really good community over there of guys willing to help each other out. Um, there's lots of good information. People have a lot of good fun. 
So if you're, and if you're interested in this type of stuff, I mean, that is, in my mind at least, the perfect place to go. Um, I don't think there's really another community like it, so. So it's fighting a little bit more, but it, nothing that the suction cup feet can't handle. The problem with the, or the advantage of the suction cup feet really is the ability to move it in off the edge a little bit. Having to keep the stuffer right along the edge to use that wood clamp was always a bit of a bother to me. This just works a lot better. The only thing I can't quite figure out and I'm open to suggestions is storing it. Anywhere I put it down, it, trying to move it just takes forever. So if somebody has a, a recommendation, I mean, I try putting it on non-smooth surfaces. That obviously helps, but it's not always easy to find non-smooth surfaces around here. I tried putting a little piece of butcher paper underneath it. That definitely helped, but cutting a new piece of butcher paper for it every time was kind of a pain. Listen, such a baby comment. Cutting a piece of butcher paper for it every time was too hard. Couldn't do it. Um, and then as far as smoking goes with this, uh, with snack sticks, I personally don't really think the type of wood you use makes much of a difference at all. So we use hickory. Um, I've tried apple, I've tried pecan. Uh, the only one I think really makes any difference is mesquite. And I just think that because the intensity of uh, the smoke is a little bit too strong for me on the mesquite. But as far as what you smoke it over, I really don't think it matters much. I'm sure some people probably disagree with that, but to each their own. It's holding out some minor hope that everything would go perfectly smooth and I would beat 7.30. Me? I'm always having fun. As long as I'm not bogged down in doing paperwork. This is... A about the most fun I think I'm legally allowed to have at work. So. Although some of those early podcasts, some of those got pretty, pretty wild and fun. We were talking about that a couple of weeks ago and it was like, there would be podcasts where I wouldn't even remember what we talked about when we were done. Like, wait, what? Like, did we really just talk for an hour? <sighs> so. In the end, it really was the best thing for the that handle fell off again. Uh, in the end, it really was the best thing for the podcast to, for us to stop drinking. Now we've got, we would have had, uh, there will be no podcast this week, by the way, guys. Um, what we had scheduled, which would have been phenomenal, uh, fell through because of, uh, some quarantine stuff. Uh, we are gonna redo or do it. It'll be on February 8th or 9th, I think. So whatever that Friday is, is when it'll come out. We're not 100% sure how we're doing it yet, but we're gonna get Brett, the owner, and Kurt, who's gotta be the longest tenured employee um, and is a commercial salesman who's gone out to all these plants. 
they've gone out all over the country together. Uh, we're gonna get them in here, get a few libations in them, have a few snacks, and let them start telling stories from back in the day. And they've got some doozies. I can tell you that. Some really, really funny stories. Ugh. There's one about an emu or an ostrich, which I literally told to every single person I met the first time I went back to New York, because it is phenomenal. All right, here we go. And as you can see, obviously I've got a good amount of pressure on this handle. You don't wanna just let that go. If you do need to stop for any reason, hold it for a second and bring it back around to where there's no more pressure because this is fighting us. 